Regarding this matter, it is precisely the same problem here. What does it mean when you consider that BlackRock and Fidelity, along with several other Bitcoin trusts, have accumulated 10 billion assets under management ELM for Bitcoin exchange traded funds ETFs? The possession of 200,000 Bitcoin by a small group of actors who are subject to regulation for their actions. As of right moment, they possess the same level of authority a circle has with Bitcoin. They are going to acquire an increasing amount of the supply as more of these legacy performers come into the picture. A fifth of what Satoshi possesses is already in their possession. Do you remember the freakout that occurred in Team B? What if Satoshi returns and sells all of his coins? That is a question that Team Orange keeps bringing up. 200,000 of your coins are now in the possession of some of the wealthiest and most influential international globalist organizations whom you have just asked to participate, despite the increasing level of excitement. There have been dissident views that have developed inside the cryptocurrency market when it comes to spot Bitcoin ETFs. These voices believe that the entire attempt is in direct opposition to the fundamental principles that guide the business. In a video that was released not too long ago, Charles Hoskinson, the founder of Cardano, voiced his reservations about the most recent events in the cryptocurrency business. He specifically mentioned his concerns about the involvement of large Wall Street organizations such as BlackRock and Fidelity. Hoskinson titled his video Legacy is Eating Crypto, in which he asserted that the sector is actually witnessing the infiltration of the corrupt legacy system into Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, the Despite the fact that it is celebrating Bitcoin's entry into mainstream financial circles while simultaneously celebrating its acceptance. A study that was published by the analytics firm K33 Research approximately two weeks ago stated that the nine newly created exchange traded funds had together acquired more than 200,000 Bitcoin, which was worth at approximately $9.5 billion at the time. After less than a month of trading, this significant milestone was accomplished. Significant price improvements in the cryptocurrency asset market have been brought about by the adoption of Bitcoin exchange traded funds ETFs and the consequent accumulation of Bitcoin. As a result, the price of Bitcoin has above $50,000 for the first time since late 2021 onward. Hoskinson, on the other hand, cautions that the industry's preoccupation with price appreciation and its contempt for the possible hazards posed by these financial products might ultimately result in disastrous outcomes for the entire industry in the not-too-distant future. Hoskinson also brought up concerns over asset-backed stablecoins such as USDT and USDC in a video that he released to YouTube not too long ago. It is his opinion that both stablecoins and other regulated assets, in addition to other cryptocurrencies, constitute a substantial threat to the cryptocurrency industry's ability to continue its development and maintain its independence. Recently, I was a guest on a number of different podcasts, and during those appearances, I made the point that asset-backed stablecoins are a little troublesome and that algorithmic stablecoins are an essential item that we as an industry need to look into. Because I really, really enjoy this data from Coinmetrics and Alilium, I wanted to share it with you. This is a PowerPoint presentation that was created internally, but I wanted to share it with you instead. In any case, stables account for approximately 10% of the total value of the cryptocurrency market, with USDT and USDTC constituting the vast majority of stables. In spite of this, they control approximately 70% of the total amount of transactions that take place on the blockchain. As a result, Ethereum and Bitcoin are not as important as USDC and USDT when it comes to the cryptocurrency market. These are the processes that our industry uses to transmit value, measured in terms of volume. These transactions account for the vast majority of the on-chain traffic and value transfer that occurs inside our sector. When it comes to these two gentlemen, USDT and USDC, there is something about them. They are backed by assets, secured by assets. It is a really pertinent term. Secured by assets? This indicates that there are two qualities that you are unable to avoid. The fact that there is a central issuer is one among the properties. There is a company that is subject to the rules and the regulations of a certain jurisdiction and whatever that jurisdiction wishes to impose upon that company, whether it be permissive or otherwise, they are subject to it. This company is a business that is reacting to that regulation, such as a bank or any other type of business. It is not that I am trying to minimize them or that I am implying that they are horrible performers or that they are evil people or something. When I claim that they exist within a jurisdiction, I am simply stating that. They fall under the purview of regulations. Cryptocurrency does not have this. 
Cryptocurrency holds a worldwide value. The individuals who have it are subject to the regulations that are in place in their respective communities. If you are in Estonia, then you are required to comply with that. If you are in South America or Argentina, you are included in the scope of this regulation. You are suddenly subject to the jurisdiction of the United States of America if you conduct business with a person who is a citizen of the United States. Nevertheless, Bitcoin as a protocol does not get up in the morning and declare, I comply with the laws of the United States. One such currency is a stable coin that is backed by assets. In that regard, there is no way to get around it. The top two are obligated to, for the most part, comply with what the government of the United States of America says. They are still unable to violate, and they are unable to push too far in one direction, even if. They are running away a little bit like Tether. At the end of the day, neither of these things is possible. As a result, this is the initial group of issues that arise with asset-backed stable coins. As for the second set, they are not allowed to use fractions. Moreover, this is a great thing. However, in the case of a hard fork, let's assume that there is a splitting of Bitcoin and that there is either Bitcoin A or Bitcoin B. Alternatively, in Ethereum splitting, Ethereum A and Ethereum B would be more relevant to this example. A scenario in which the issuer of stable coins says, you know what, is not something that can occur. For the time being, I will allow my steady coin to be on both sides. We are going to just let it rest. How come? Simply because. They are only backed by 50 cents to the dollar, which is the result of doubling the supply. They are required to select a victor. They can choose either A or B. It is either A or B, but they cannot choose both. They are unable to pick every single one of your value transfers takes place at that consistent coin level, and the entire decentralized finance sector is dependent on it. It is impossible for you to be the chain that unexpectedly loses USDC or Tether. It is expected of you to be the other chain. Suppose they decide to separate, and one of them announces that they are going to implement KYC across the entire system, and the stablecoins agree with that decision. And on the other hand, they have just lost your steady coin from your possession. Consequently, they have lost all of their liquid assets. The entirety of their DeFi backbone was lost. This is what you do. Because of this quality, they are compelled to name a victor. That authority has been implicitly transferred to the stablecoin issuer, also known as the asset-backed stablecoin issuer because of your actions. A tiny group of people that you have never communicated with, with whom you do not have any contact and who you did not vote for. They are completely unrelated to the asset that you are investing in. That power is uniquely theirs. Regarding this matter, it is precisely the same problem here. What does it mean when you consider that BlackRock and Fidelity, along with several other Bitcoin trusts, have accumulated 10 billion assets under management arm for Bitcoin exchange traded funds ETFs? The possession of 200,000 Bitcoin by a small group of actors who are subject to regulation for their actions. You have all of the Orange team members running around saying, well, no, they don't, despite the fact that they have the exact same authority as Circle now with Bitcoin. It is the miners who are in charge. Let's go ahead and carry out the experiment, shall we? The Bitcoin chain A and the Bitcoin chain B are created as a result of the fork. And the exchange-traded funds ETF say, you know, we support chain B, therefore, what do they do? They sell all of the assets that they have that have recently been reproduced in chain A. They do this with any and all assets that they possess. What kind of impact does this have on the cost of chain A? As it falls, it is in free fall. And you know what happens is that miners say things like, well, we have the same amount of hash power, but if I mine A, I get 25, 50, or 